I, I was thinking as I was looking at this that it's actually a bit strange that you have to give a talk called Autism in Adult Life, uh, which sort of highlights, I think, um, the sort of prevailing belief over the last 50 years that it's a disorder uh, of childhood and somehow it disappears when people reach adult life. Um, I've been interested in this area probably for about, oh, um, about 18 years really because when I was at the Maudsley I used to run two clinical teams. One um, that saw young children, you know, do they have ASD or language delay or something esoteric. The team that Mike Rutter set up called the Home Base team. This was uh, based on a study that he and Bill Yule and Pat Howlin had done of outreach work to uh, families of predominantly children with autism um, showing that, that if you were sort of aggressive in supporting uh, parents the, the outcome for the kids was much better and then this morphed mainly into providing outreach for adults. Um, so when I was at the Maudsley I probably spent about three quarters of my time seeing kids and a quarter uh, adults. And when I moved to Oxford um, the, the situation there for adults was absolutely dire. Uh, there was nothing uh, whatsoever. So I then sort of reversed my clinical work. So I'd spend about three quarters of the time seeing able adolescents and adults and hardly any time seeing kids. My guess is that, that probably that'll be how I spend my clinical time here as well. So um, in the UK, and I think also over here and in the US, um, there's starting to be more of an emphasis on adults. So if any of you have a particular interest in this, the, the National Audit Office in the UK uh, published a report last summer about provision for adults. Uh, and the report could really have been written about any uh, developed country, so it's not really UK specific. And um, the government now has an autism adult strategy as a, as a consequence of uh, that report. Uh, and the reason it's really come to attention in the UK is because of the recognition that autism is much more common than people had previously realised, uh, a realisation that these people continue to have autism into adult life, and concern particularly uh, from parents that the individuals are just disappearing uh, off the radar of services once they turn 18. If there are services, they're uh, not generally very good. And so the, the sort of pressure uh, for the National Audit Office to, to, to get onto this really came from um, MPs who have children with autism. Um, this wasn't uh, anything <coughs> magic, it was who you know. Uh, that made a difference. And I think the truth is that it doesn't matter which country uh, you go to, it tends to be uh, parental groups and well-connected uh, parents who, who know where the levers of power are and know how to get things uh, moving. It's very rarely the case that governments show any initiative uh, themselves on this issue unless they're put under um, some pressure. I'm really going to focus on ABLE individuals with autism and Asperger's syndrome because historically they're the group that get um, missed. They, they often reach uh, adolescence or adult life without a, a diagnosis um, and certainly in the UK if you have an IQ below 70 you, you sort of hit lots of boxes and, and services are in place for the rest of your <laughs> life. If you have an IQ above 70, our learning disability services say you're too bright for us, uh, and adult psychiatry services say actually we know nothing about this, and so people get batted uh, back and forward in, in a sort of group of patients uh, without a hope. So uh, most of this is really going to focus on able autism and Asperger's.
So um, these are just the, the diagnostic criteria for autism, and it's worth just spending a few minutes thinking about how autism looks in adult uh, life. So it's still the case that um, even very able individuals who've had lots of support through childhood will still show the characteristic difficulties with non-verbal interaction. You can of course teach people uh, to look at faces and engage in eye contact, but you'll still pick up subtle uh, differences in terms of sort of this <laughs> constant uh, modulation of eye contact that we all engage in. Um, and um, that, that's usually one of the most telling features. And, and even if people get good at recognizing facial expressions in others, they might still show a fairly limited range of facial expressions uh, themselves. Now, the the diagnostic criteria for peer relationships we know is actually much too severe. Uh, lots of people on the spectrum do develop uh, high quality uh, peer relationships in adolescence and adult life. Sometimes those will be with other individuals with Asperger's. It's not unusual to go into a school to see a kid and to find out that the friend they have uh, also has Asperger's <coughs> or it has some sort of uh, developmental uh, difficulty. And um, I can remember when working with Mike Rutter that uh, Ripvo published a paper on um, a group of families in Utah in which he claimed that three of these individuals had got married and Mike sort of exploded and said people with autism don't get married. And of course he was right in terms of our conceptualization of where the spectrum ended 20 years ago. Uh, but we know now that actually many people on the spectrum uh, get married, some with a diagnosis and some who uh, don't realise they've got a disorder. And of course, some of them come to attention when they have affected kids. Uh, and then the penny sort of drops that, that maybe they have similar difficulties as well. The um, lack of socio-emotional reciprocity uh, to some extent ameliorates uh, as people develop because of course people learn tricks uh, for getting by, they, they learn sort of off pat social chat and things like that uh, and can use uh, these things to get by in uh, daily life but, but often they will be thrown if they're in a non-routine um, situation. Again historically we used to think that only half of people with autism acquired useful uh, language but again that was because we were focusing on the very severe end of uh, the spectrum. And the issue for um, adults uh, with Asperger's tends to be the, the difficulty with social chat and conversation. Uh, so many individuals with Asperger's wonder why the rest of us engage in chit chat. You know, how much have you talked about the weather today? You don't need to talk about the weather. Anyone could see the snow but you will have spent a lot of time talking about it. And you're not really talking about the weather uh, because of some sort of logical interest in the weather. You're doing it to you know, establish some social uh, interaction with people. So a lot of what we talk about all day long, the, the content is irrelevant. It's simply a mechanism for establishing a, a social uh, link with people. And of course, that's a very funny thing to do from a very logical perspective. And if you meet people with Asperger's who seem to have quite good social chat. Usually they'll tell you they've learned it. Uh, and actually they don't feel it, but they know they have to do it uh, in order uh, to get by. And sometimes they'll have trouble judging what's the right amount of social uh, chat. So I had a patient, a very smart guy with a PhD, who was forever getting in trouble at work for talking with his colleagues too much and that was because he'd stop as he was going past someone's desk and have a chat uh, with them and he couldn't understand what the problem was because he said everyone else does it but he couldn't read the clues as to when it was time to stop and, and leave uh, the person alone. Now the, the re repetitive and stereotype speech in individuals uh, with Asperger's can be very very high level um, indeed.
and I remember talking to Chris uh, Frith a few years ago who had um, he and his wife Yuta had Temple Grandin staying overnight because she was in town to give a talk and he said she, she was so good at talking and her conversational skills were so good that after about two hours he was beginning to wonder if in fact she did have ASD and then she reached the end and started again <laughs> in other words most of what she'd said for two hours was scripted but you wouldn't know because it was at a very very high level indeed and in, in fact it's a very useful thing to do diagnostically if you think an adult has got uh, Asperger's and you're not sure is to see them again because very often you you'll hear the same language absolutely verbatim but it, it's not easy to pick up um, especially as quite often some of the prosodic abnormalities may not be uh, so marked in adult life and um, sometimes you'll only hear them if people are stressed uh, or, or so for instance you might hear some prosodic abnormalities at the beginning of a conversation whilst the person is anxious because they haven't met you uh, before and then as they settle the, the, the quality of their speech um, will sound more normal. So we're very used in, in kids to uh, young kids of all ability levels showing lots of uh, stereotypies, uh, very useful diagnostically and I always used to think that the more able people grew out of these but it's not true uh, they don't grow out of them they just learn to do them in private uh, so that the man I was telling you about with the PhD uh, wore out several carpets in his home through spinning on the spot for three quarters of an hour uh, I know lots of other people who flap in their rooms and engage in all sorts of uh, motor stereotypies and you only find out about these things if you ask people because they've learnt usually in adolescence that uh, it's not a sensible thing to do in public. Um, the unusual uh, preoccupations and, and circumscribed interests usually uh, persist into adult life of course they do change o over time sometimes the, the sort of things that people move along to are very interesting so uh, I had a patient who was bullied mercilessly at school because she had a fascination with Hitler um, and would dress in sort of Nazi style garb and then in early adult life uh, this morphed into an obsession with Judaism and uh, she wanted to convert uh, so, so that was a very interesting example of how by reading so much about uh, the Nazi period the, 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 um, the interest had shifted slightly um, I think people get better at um, integrating their sort of routinized behavior into uh, daily life and of course some people pull off the knack of making their circumscribed interest a career uh, which, which is really probably the best possible um, outcome for these individuals. We have really no idea whatsoever of what the rate of epilepsy is in people with Asperger's syndrome because there's never been a, a, a good uh, study. My clinical impression is that it's slightly above the population base rate but probably uh, not a great uh, deal um, and as you know lots of people with Asperger's syndrome get misdiagnosed as having ADHD uh, in childhood because it's a common comorbid disorder and it seems to be their main problem when they're, they're uh, young children and often the, the attentional and organizational difficulties will persist um, into adult life so it's a pattern I would talking earlier about supporting students at university who have Asperger's syndrome and uh, when I was doing this at, at Oxford you would have some ferociously bright people you know the tutors would say brightest student they've ever had who couldn't organize them so it was for love and the money they, they couldn't plan they couldn't stick to timetables they couldn't find their way around uh, the university so so being exceptional in some areas is, is not a guarantee that you can use uh, those skills.
Um, there's been increasing interest over the last few years in the sensory oversensitivities, I think particularly because vocal, able individuals with Asperger's syndrome who have these problems have complained about them and have complained that professionals are not taking them uh, seriously uh, enough. Um, and it was brought home to me last year when I was seeing a mum um, who, who was picked up because she had a son with Asperger's syndrome and eventually she found her way uh, to me. And she has um, auditory oversensitivity and she described loud noises as being like someone sticking pins in her. This was physically painful uh, and I hadn't really realised just how upsetting it could be for people and, and until she mentioned that. Um, but these sensory oversensitivities are not ubiquitous and, and that sort of extreme uh, example is fairly unusual. Now, this is a very old slide, but I love this slide because Eric did such a good job of sort of dissecting out um, the way these individuals fall out. So essentially what has changed is that if you add up all the numbers in the left-hand column, they come to 60 in 10,000. We now know that it, it should be 100 in 10,000. So I think using a prevalence rate of 1% is very handy because it's a number that people can remember. It's definitely not going to be far out uh, of the true race. And it reminds people that ASD is as common as schizophrenia, which also has uh, a prevalence of 1%. So um, how has it shot up um, from 2 in 10,000 uh, to 100 in 10,000? Um, we know that the increase um, in diagnosis of people with sort of core autism who still have uh, predominantly uh, mental retardation as well has probably come about because we've got better at spotting autism in handicapped individuals and there have been some nice studies in California showing that as the rate of diagnosis of autism has gone up the rate of diagnosis of pure uh, MR has gone down. But the real increase has come in this leftover category, PDD not otherwise specified. In other words, it sort of looks and smells like autism, but it isn't. Uh, and we've realized that, in fact, the majority of people on the spectrum uh, do not fall at the severe end of the spectrum. They fall uh, at the milder end. And of course, I'm not going to talk today about the fact that we know that the spectrum extends into milder difficulties that don't reach a sort of clinical threshold but that occur at an increased rate in uh, relatives as well. Um, you can see that across the spectrum, um, and, and this study had an upper age cutoff of six, so it's likely that many individuals with Asperger's and PDD NOS simply were uh, picked up. You can see that the, um, the sex ratio is pretty constant in all of these, but there have been studies over the years suggesting that the excess of males in Asperger's may be as high as 8 to 1 or indeed 15 uh, to 1, which um, would be very unusual if it was true because it's unusual in medical disorders to have a sex ratio that, that changes as you go across the spectrum of severity. And, and everyone has realized over the last <laughs> few years that we miss the women with Asperger's syndrome. Um, and I think we miss them because usually they're superficially more socially interested uh, than the men. They will often have uh, friends. And also they're interests tend to be less unusual uh, than in the men. So they're not doing really odd things that might bring them uh, to clinical attention. And many of the women that I've seen have been diagnosed because of having children uh, with autism. And uh, there's also been a realization over the last few years that you need to actively exclude Asperger's in teenagers with anorexia. Uh, very, very common uh, for these girls to end up in an adolescent unit with severe anorexia uh, 
and then the staff begin to realise that actually they have social problems as well. I get asked to go along, you take a history, and they have amazing uh, circumscribed interests that, that no one had ever picked up previously because the, the family just thought, you know, collecting 500 of something was a bit unusual, but not really um, a problem. So in the same way that if you're making a diagnosis of ADHD in someone, you should exclude the possibility of Asperger's. It's the same with uh, anorexia. Um, and this is now becoming quite a sort of topic for research, really, because it's making people wonder whether all these pre-morbid things that we've associated with anorexia have in fact been, uh, to some extent, ASD. So the, the mechanisms we need to think about in, in adult life are not just uh, the impairments in understanding social behaviour and being able to have normal non-verbal behaviours oneself um, what causes difficulty for people are all these things that in a sense are not part of the diagnostic criteria so difficulties in self uh, control get people into trouble uh, it's one thing to have a tantrum when you're two. It's not so acceptable to do it when you're a, an older teenager or uh, an adult. The difficulties in flexibility can stop people uh, achieving their potential be because they're too rigid uh, for their own good. But actually what uh, really incapacitates most people with Asperger's is very high anxiety uh, levels. So probably in the UK at the moment about half of all people with Asperger's under diagnosis are on SSRIs uh, in an effort to reduce anxiety. Um, in the UK we, we tend to use drugs as a second line. We will try behavioural and cognitive therapy approaches first but, but in my experience um, often these individuals are so anxious when you get your hands on them um, that it, in fact you have to medicate them first before you can even start to teach them uh, cognitive strategies. Is Adele. there a sense that they tend to be anxious about certain things in particular? Like they're obviously often picking up on that they're not being accepted socially. So okay. or is that what they're so, uh, anxious So I, I was about to come on to that. So it, it's not surprising that if you've got Asperger's you're anxious. <laughs> uh, so when I was here uh, when I arrived in July, I, I sort of came here, A, having been told it never snows in Vancouver, <laughs> and B, uh, thinking that because you all spoke Canadian and I spoke English, that I would sort of slot in really very easily. And I hadn't banked on how many subtle social differences there were. So for about the first two months, I thought every waitress in Vancouver had fallen in love with me. <laughs> Uh, you know, they come and talk to me, tell me their names, touch me on the shoulder, and oh, I would go out on cloud nine. I eventually worked out after about two months that this all was a monetary uh, transaction. <laughs> and uh, by, by about the middle of August, I was thinking, this is what it must feel like to have autism. I knew that you all knew stuff that I didn't know, but I couldn't figure out how I was meant to get this uh, knowledge. You know, how do you know that the machine on the bus doesn't give you change if you give it three dollars instead of two and a half? But, and tiny things like that. So there is no doubt, I think, that if you move in a world where you don't know what half of the information is, that would make any of us anxious. But if you look at relatives of people uh, with ASD, their rates of anxiety and depression are well above population base rates, even amongst relatives that don't live with the child with ASD. So there seems to be some genetic uh, component as well. Um, and you will see some individuals where the, the anxiety is highly focused and others who just have you know, high levels of, of state anxiety all the time. And I, I think... Um, there's a significant biological component to this and one of the problems that people have is they don't know what anxiety is and they don't understand the significance of the physical uh, 
symptoms that we all know are telling us we're anxious. Uh, and actually you often have to spend a fair bit of time teaching people to, to pay more attention uh, to their bodies so that they know when they're uh, getting anxious. Because what will often happen is a person is getting anxious, they don't look anxious, no person with ASD ever looks anxious, uh, so no one around realizes they're getting anxious, then all of a sudden they'll blow. And they'll blow because uh, the person they're interacting with hasn't realized they're getting anxious, so hasn't changed what they're saying or, or doing to take account of uh, that, and then wonders why this person has suddenly uh, flipped in some way. So, um, with adults, most of my <coughs> clinical work is treating anxiety after people have uh, got a diagnosis. Now, bizarrely, even the most able individuals on the spectrum will find it difficult to engage in long-term planning and, and establishing goals and knowing how to get themselves uh, to where they um, want to be. Uh, and that's very common amongst the university population. And of course it means that often they might do reasonably well at university and then drop off afterwards because no one has thought actually these people need active career counselling rather than you know what they're going to do just popping into their heads like it does for the rest of us. And I think uh, the anxiety, uh, the social isolation, uh, the rigidity, the lack of goals usually end up in low self-esteem unless families and clinicians are actively uh, working to do something about that. So I think the problems for people with ASD are not simply the difficulty in social communication. There are these other aspects of uh, the disorder that are very handicapping indeed. And the overarching problem, I think, is that people like us are not ambitious enough for these individuals. We've sort of got used to a model of where if you have a developmental disorder, providing you're not causing any trouble or costing too much money in adult life, that's fine. You know, society has done its bit. But in fact, these are by and large a group of people, most of whom should be in work, some of whom have outstanding talents in, in particular areas, and actually society loses out if we're not constantly pushing uh, people to do more and more. And uh, I think one of the advantages of seeing adults is, you know, and over a long period of time, is I find parents who say this person is still gaining <laughs> skills in their 30s and 40s. You know, skills that make a significant difference to their quality uh, of life. And of course, we're just not used to that. We, we, you know, We've all got better at committees as we've got older, but most of the things we know how to do, we knew how to do when we were 20. Uh, and that simply isn't the case because these individuals are learning skills via different routes than the rest of us. So the challenges are, firstly, um, for those people who are capable of going into higher education to make sure they survive, um, universities are generally not as good as they could be at supporting students with Asperger's. At Oxford, um, the, the disability office there always told me that uh, oh, they had about a thousand students with a diagnosis of dyslexia, lots of blind people, lots of deaf people, people with cerebral palsy, all sorts <coughs> of handicaps. Uh, they only had about 15 students with declared or recognized Asperger's and they said those 15 caused them more work than all the other students put together. And that was because people in colleges or in departments didn't know what to do in order to support people effectively. And if you didn't have a diagnosis and weren't getting any support at all, many of those people wouldn't last a term. They'd be socially isolated, stuck in their rooms. The university wasn't comfortable about being more parental with them, and they'd disappear at Christmas, and that was it, would never come back. And many of them ended up getting depressed uh, because of the mix of isolation and not keeping up uh, with work. Now, many people won't go in uh, 
to higher education um, and would like to have a job. Uh, if you talk to individuals with Asperger's men and ask them what they want though in, in their lives, they'll normally say a wife, a car, a job and a house, which I suspect is what any member of the population would say. Well, unless you're a woman in which case you'd want a partner. Can they get work? No. And the reason they can't get work is because firstly they don't know how to go about doing it. No one has actively taught them about CVs or how to appear in job interviews. I've coached lots of people and given them mock job interviews. Uh, and uh, it's amazing how they find it hard to know what's the right amount to say. I mean, it's a real skill in the job interview, isn't it? When someone asks you, why do you want this job? You've got to give an answer that's about four sentences long. If you give one sentence, that's not enough. And if you go on for five minutes, that's too much. And we intuitively know what's the right amount uh, to say. So getting a, a job in the first place can be uh, difficult. And then hanging on to it is even more difficult if you don't know how to behave at work. So usually the problem that people run into is not the mechanics of doing the job, which usually they're very capable of doing, it's all the social interaction that surrounds uh, the job. And of course many people um, have had such a miserable time during secondary education and they've usually been bullied and socially isolated that the thought of going to work doesn't even cross their minds and they just sit on the sofa all day long or um, at the computer. And what the National Audit Office found was that the major cost of these disorders in adult life is coming about because people are not in work and we're paying them disability uh, allowance and most of these individuals could be in work. And of course most of us get our sense of who we are and self-esteem from our jobs. Um, so if you haven't got a job, that's uh, another uh, component of, of low self-esteem. If you've gone through childhood and adolescence um, with obvious difficulties and your, your parents have been good parents and sort of compensated and protected you, there's every likelihood you won't have as many self-help uh, skills when you reach early adult life as the rest of the population because your parents have done everything for you because they've figured out you're having a hard enough time at school that asking you to clean your bedroom or learn how to use a washing machine or budget or go to the shop is the, the least of the difficulties. So one's left with a huge number of people who are very smart um, and can't take public transport. They can't budget. The, all these things that we uh, take for granted, these individuals don't have uh, these skills. So it, it is a real issue um, to, to try and teach people these skills and often very difficult to get to persuade parents. They might have to be slightly cruel to be uh, kind. That If they keep on doing everything for the individual, they're never going to be able to survive um, independently. Many, many people with Asperger's want relationships, either friendships or romantic uh, relationships, uh, and find, find it very upsetting uh, they can't have these relationships. And um, some eventually just give up. Um, and of course, some people with Asperger's kill themselves because they get so depressed and they're so socially isolated. I've already talked about the comorbid disorders, which are usually anxiety and depression. Um, occasionally, if someone's had anxiety, severe anxiety, for long enough, they'll develop a, a stress-induced psychosis. And you can nearly always unpick it when you take the history because you can see that this has been brewing up uh, over a number of years. And some people will develop schizophrenia as well. Whether the rate of schizophrenia is elevated, uh, I think, is very difficult uh, no. So in terms of people's needs, the, the most obvious one is they need a diagnosis. We, we can't tackle uh, any of these other issues unless someone's got the label, because without the label they can't get the support, and I've tried to indicate that the support needs to be in many, many uh, different areas. And getting a diagnosis as an adult is not easy. 
uh, by and large, adult psychiatrists are not always comfortable about giving the diagnosis because they, they think they're not seeing enough people to know whether someone's got Asperger's or not. Um, and um, by and large, most child psychiatrists won't see adults. Um, so it can be very difficult, certainly in the UK, uh, to get a diagnosis in adult life. Uh, my, my impression is it's the same here. Is that um, true? So one of the things that's on my agenda for next year is to try and teach all the adult psychiatrists in the province about Asperger's so they at least know what it looks like uh, and begin the process of getting um, a diagnosis. So the, the education isn't just education in childhood, it's higher education and continuing, I mean education in the broadest sense, not just academic education, it's teaching uh, people these skills to address their handicaps, to try and make sure that they're not developing uh, depression. And then to try and work out what the person's strengths are. Uh, and I put a lot of emphasis on that for two reasons. One is, um, if people have particular talents, then being good at something is your best defense against getting depressed. Uh, if you're failing in every area of your life, depression is almost <coughs> inevitable. But, but if there are some things you know you're better at than anyone else in your town, that's a, a saving grace. But the other reason we want to pick on people's strengths is to push them towards an area of employment that plays to their strengths rather than uh, their weaknesses. Uh, and in the UK we have a particular <coughs> problem that psychologists uh, are nowadays so busy that getting them to carry out a psychometric assessment of someone with an IQ in the normal range is nearly uh, impossible. And as you know, uh, people's <coughs> profile of strengths and weaknesses is so <coughs> unpredictable that unless you actually test uh, someone, you're re not really going to know uh, how those how those cognitive strategies would map on to the sorts of work they could or couldn't do. And um, the issue about ambition isn't just for the individual, it's more to do with the rest of us uh, realizing uh, that just having someone not depressed uh, isn't really good enough and, and that we ought to be constantly monitoring and reviewing people's progress. And of course people need social networks, everyone needs social networks, even people with Asperger's, but they can have trouble establishing those uh, themselves and very often it falls on professionals to set up groups or mentoring schemes or befriending schemes to help people. For me, I, I think the goals are to make sure that people have the highest possible quality of life uh, and that they're making a useful contribution uh, to society because that makes them feel um, good about themselves. So if we have um, people getting a diagnosis in adulthood for the first time, one, one of the problems we have in the UK is that everything is set up for a sort of an acute illness. Uh, so we're very good at managing the presenting anxiety or depression um, and then not so good at keeping up uh, support and intervention over uh, many years. If I see a new patient who, who's in a bad way without a diagnosis, I'd normally say to them, it'll take me five years to turn your life around for you because I've learned from experience that's how long it takes. It might take a year or so to get them over the, the anxiety or depression and then you have to allow a lot of time to get people to agree to do new things if they're naturally uh, rather rigid and also it might take many years to persuade parents that they've got to alter their, their sort of conceptualization of how to uh, deal with the person. And we, we have this bizarre situation in the UK where the moment you turn 18 and you're in the mental health system your parents no longer exist. You're now an independent person and therefore no one will talk to your parents about you because of breaking confidentiality and of course that's a complete nonsense for these individuals because they're not leaving home uh, by and large they need their parents in early adult life in order to function well and you, you do have to work uh, with families at the end of the day the, all that individual has is their family 
to fall back on. And even if you see parents of very <coughs> young children for diagnosis, the, the thing uh, that will reduce them to tears is when they start to talk about who's going to look after this person when I'm no longer around. Uh, so it, it's not sensible uh, to ignore families and act as though an adult with ASD uh, should be treated as an independent individual, completely like everyone else. We have to recognise their independence, but we've got to recognise they're also part of a concerned family. So the main problem in the UK is that people never have a plan. Uh, the plan usually consists of dealing with the immediate problem and then discharging the person. That's typically what happens in adult psychiatry because there are such demands on services. And we, really what you need is a long-term plan, a plan that goes over several years where you're really effectively tackling all these different areas of need. And you also need to review how this is going. Um, if you get a diagnosis of autism in childhood in the UK, you, you see a doctor to get the diagnosis and then you'll never see the doctor again. Uh, the idea that you might review patients and give advice to families and schools and sort of aim for optimal outcome just doesn't apply in the area of uh, autism. It's somehow all left uh, to schools and, and families to cope by themselves. And the real art of managing these people is to sort of try and anticipate when they're going to run into uh, problems and, and prevent them so that if you're sending people into higher education you're putting in the work in advance to make sure it doesn't go wrong rather than reacting when, when the tutor comes to you and says I find this person impossible, they talk in class or, or uh, whatever. Um, I saw a student actually I didn't see the student I saw uh, 20 very angry chemistry professors in the summer before I came here. Uh, you know, collective IQ in the millions. Um, and they were convinced that this student was going to blow up the whole of Oxford. You know, how could you have someone with ASD in a lab with dangerous chemicals? Really awful um, expectations of what was going to go wrong. He was a very good chemist, I have to say. And several of the professors of chemistry also had Asperger's, which didn't, <laughs> uh, which didn't help maybe, because they, they were as rigid as the students about what the risks were or weren't. So this is not rocket science. This is just good old-fashioned medicine or social work or whatever we're going to call it, where you, you're in there for the long term and you're very strategic about what you do. Um, but people will come to doctors, often in a bad way. That's how you tend to get a diagnosis in adult life. You present with anxiety or uh, depression to your family doctor who might then send you on to a psychiatrist. And um, very important to try and find out how people are getting by at the moment, you know, what compensatory strategies have they learnt over the years to get by, or how do they spend their time, how do they reduce their anxiety. Most people reduce anxiety uh, by drinking or smoking cannabis. Uh, very, very common for very anxious people with Asperger's in the UK to drink if they haven't come to <coughs> medical attention. And then, of course, they can become addicted and you've got a, a secondary uh, problem there. Another issue is that often uh, these individuals are not very keen to take medication. Many of them will know more about the medication than I know. You know, they've gone online, they've researched it, and of course, if you were to believe the safety sheet on any medication you take, you wouldn't take it. You know, if you're the one in a million chance it'll give you liver cancer, well, how do you know you're the, not the one unlucky uh, person? So often it's very challenging uh, to persuade people that, to, to give medication a trial. Uh, if you can get them on it, usually that they realise straight away that they're feeling... Uh, much better. And one of, the, one of the sort of paradoxes of managing either children or adults with ASD is that we're dealing with an extremely biological disorder and yet the mainstay of intervention is manipulating the environment. 
Uh, and, and it's very hard to train new doctors on autism. That, that the fact this is biological doesn't mean the answer is uh, biological. You have to arrange the environment so the person with ASD can function um, in it. And then shift on to a sort of long-term management strategy. Um, this is a question that doesn't just apply to adults. This, this is sort of the $64,000 uh, question across the whole of autism. When, when we intervene, what are we doing? And I think we're nearly always helping alternative strategies, uh, whether it's teaching face processing skills or, or just about any area uh, you care to think of. When you dissect what people with ASD are doing and you carry out the sorts of studies that Adele does, you find out by and large they're using different mechanisms, even in areas at which they're not showing any impairment. So one of the traps it's easy to fall into is to assume that there are these so-called islands of preserved ability in ASD. I think that's highly unlikely given what we know about the neuropathology. I think it's that there are many different ways that brains can do things and often people with autism, uh, their normal performance is subsumed by a, a completely different mechanism than in the rest of us. Um, so I, I, th this is very important to bear in mind when you're trying to think how to help uh, people, just getting them to do what a typically developing person might do often won't work. The, the, the focused education and environmental manipulation I've already talked about, um, often people will need uh, some sort of CBT uh, approach to help them manage uh, anxiety in the longer term. Although many of these individuals basically just have to stay on SSRIs for the whole of their life. Uh, if you try, I periodically try and stop SSRIs because we don't want people on medication forever, but nearly always uh, the person relapses once the medication uh, is stopped. You need to anticipate uh, the transition, so the big ones like leaving school, going to university, starting uh, new jobs. And, and you need to get in the person's mind the idea um, that they're responsible for themselves um, and they've got to start thinking slightly longer term. And this is difficult, I think, because there's... My guess is that the conceptualization of time by people with Asperger's may not be exactly the same as it is uh, in the rest of us. We're just about to publish a couple of papers looking at perception of time on a millisecond sort of time scale, and, it, and it's completely different uh, in people with ASD, and I suspect that their conceptualization of time in the way that we do it as a sort of visual stream, if you like, may not uh, exist in, in people's heads. Groups for adults uh, with Asperger's and ASD in the UK spend a lot of time working on communication. Uh, skills, teaching people uh, conversational strategies, getting them to realise they've got to stop uh, talking uh, occasionally, and getting people into groups. People with ASD are normally at their best in a one-to-one -one, uh, interaction. They have terrible difficulty when they get into a group because that's a cognitively much more uh, demanding situation. So it's no use just concentrating on the one to one. That won't get people by uh, in everyday life. I think what has become, what has been a revelation to most people is how socially anxious, awkward individuals with Asperger's can be fluent when they're writing emails or on the internet. Um, they can develop really good friendships uh, through those mechanisms. Uh, and I've seen schools now that are getting students in the same classroom to send emails to uh, each other because they can get them to, to communicate. And I assume the reason for this is that you're removing the anxiety associated with face-to-face -face contact, which must be very anxiety-provoking if, you, if you're not able to intuitively read the meaning of people's uh, expressions. And, and my guess is this is an area where actually if we put a bit more thought into it, we, we could probably make even more of a difference uh, to people's lives. Actually, of course, if you get to know someone 
over the internet. By the time you finally meet them face to face, you know so much about them and you're so comfortable uh, with them that uh, the, the anxiety level is going to be a lot less. Anyhow. So in, in childhood, we, we tend to focus early on on developing joint attention behaviours, turn taking things like that, and the one to one interactions with peers. But, but in the older individuals, it's the interactions with groups and teaching people. Uh, scripts. We all use scripts the whole uh, time and you, you'll catch yourself you know, in what's called a, an entrapment error where you, you're thinking about something and your, your brain is following its little scripts and you've either turned on the light when the light was already on or you've forgot to put the water in the kettle or something like this. So we get by. We don't have to think about everything we do because we've run off a, a, a script. Um, subconsciously and, and very often you have to teach people what the scripts are for getting public transport, functioning in a restaurant, buying things in uh, a shop and in, in fact the simpler the better and uh, one shouldn't be anxious I, I think about s feeling as though you're dumbing this down. People just need things that they uh, can rely on and they need things that are simple because if you're anxious you won't remember something that's terribly complicated. And of course you can teach people uh, to recognize some emotions, but the issue here is you can get people very good in a lab setting when all their attention is just on one thing. What we're able to do is recognize emotions whilst we're doing ten other things as well because we're not doing it as a conscious strategy. If, if you needing to use executive resources to do it, then the moment you're anxious or having to divide your executive resources, that becomes a bit tricky. Now, it's limiting people's repetitive behaviours that is probably uh, the biggest challenge and certainly the one I have <coughs> least success uh, with. So, um, the sort of killer nowadays is computer games. Um, you know, half of the undergraduates at Oxford with Asperger's would spend their evening you know, stuck on the computer till one or two uh, in the morning compulsively playing these things. They would play them all uh, weekend and, and trying to persuade them that that wasn't the way they were going to get their degree or could be difficult. But also of course if you're engaged in something repetitively it means you're not doing other things. You're not exposing yourself uh, to, the, to the rest of your environment and you're not <coughs> learning uh, things in, in the way that you should. So um, that, that I, I think most clinicians find that very, very difficult indeed. Um, of course, if you're anxious, that will increase your repetitive behavior, which, so the anxiety sort of permeates um, everything. Um, but reducing anxiety by itself will not eliminate uh, repetitive behaviours. The, the turning the interests into opportunities, I, I think, is very um, important. Um, the self-help skills is just basic teaching people what to do. Uh, but as Adele can speak on more eloquently than me, you can teach people planning skills, and, and that's something they really do need. Uh, you want to be in a situation when eventually when their parents die they're going to be able to function as independently as possible and if you can't plan it's actually very difficult to survive for very long at all. Uh, and this is my final slide and I've not really talked about this first issue until now. The, the main problem for individuals with Asperger's or high-functioning autism who get a diagnosis in childhood is that all the services are child-focused. In other words, we're not spending enough time thinking what are we doing to prepare these people for adult life because we don't see it as part of our remit. So we sort of eject people into <laughs> adulthood really very poorly equipped uh, to deal with the challenges they face. Equally, um, we have this idea that education is something you do to kids. And if you're learning via a different route and at a different 
speed, then you need education in the broadest sense continuing into adult life. Um, and we tend, uh, especially in medicine, to be much more interested in responding to something than, rather than heading it off, uh, which is what we should really be doing. And that means seeing people on a regular basis uh, and tweaking uh, what's going on in their life. So, um, as you've probably seen, none of this is very complicated. Uh, everyone's capable of doing it. Uh, any psychiatrist or social worker can do all of this. The problem is to get them to believe that they can do it because there's a bit of anxiety associated with moving into a new uh, clinical domain if you, if you think uh, that you don't have uh, the skills, but, but in fact any good uh, clinician or social worker or educationalist has the skills to do all of these things.